This presentation is called, What is Sexual Selection? We're going to answer four questions in this presentation. First, what is sexual selection? Second, how is sexual selection related to reproductive skew, which we'll also define? Third, what is the difference between intrasexual selection and intersexual selection? And lastly, how is sexual selection related to natural selection? <clears throat> so the study of sexual selection, like so many things in evolution, begins with Darwin. And Darwin defined sexual selection in his 1859 book, The Origin of Species, where he wrote that what I call sexual selection depends not on a struggle for existence, but on a struggle between the males for the possession of the females. The result is not death to the unsuccessful, but few or no offspring. As an example of this, that's quite famous, uh, consider male elephant seals. So in this dramatic image, two male elephant seals are fighting it out, and a lot of what they're fighting over is access to females. And that matters in terms of who wins. So in one example, in a herd of elephant seals, there were 14 male bulls. And at the end of the mating season, 26 pups had been sired and born. Of those 14 bulls, 11 sired no pups, and two sired just one pup each. But one male bull sired 24 of the 26 pups. Now when you have differences in reproductive success that are that great, that is what we mean by reproductive skew. And this is defined by Frank Marlowe in the Hadza as simply the degree of variation in the number of offspring produced between individuals in a population. Something interesting about reproductive skew in mammals is that it's often associated with high levels of sexual dimorphism and especially in terms of the male being larger than the female. So in case of the elephant seals, who we just discussed, males run about 5,000 pounds, while female elephant seals run about 1,400 pounds. So males are about three times larger. And this also is evident in many primate species where polygyny is related to sexual dimorphism. An excellent example is given by gorillas. So when reproductive skew between males is high, as it is among gorillas who live in harems, where there's one male and multiple females, you often see pronounced differences in size between males and females. And male silverback gorillas are more than twice as large as females. So that follows that expectation. But what about humans? Well, overall, a size sexual dimorphism in humans appears to be getting less over the last several million years. And in contemporary humans, it's actually not that great. So it's easy for us to imagine a pair of humans, a male and female, where the male is much larger. But if we look at average or mean body weights, the difference is not nearly as great as what we see in gorillas or certainly what we see in elephant seals. So here's some numbers from a recent National Health Survey of Americans, and the mean body weight of a 19-year-old American male, this is, the data was collected between 2002 and 2006, was 177 pounds, and the mean height was right about five feet nine inches. For a 19-year-old American female, the mean weight was 149 pounds, 
and the mean height right about five foot four inches. So if we compare those, then American females at 19 years old are 84% of the size of American males. And I use 19 year olds because Americans tend to get quite obese after age 19. We can also look at studies of the Hadza done by Frank Marlowe where he found that adult Hadza males on average were 117 pounds and 5 feet 4 inches, whereas Hadza adult females averaged 101 pounds and 4 feet 11 inches. But if we look at females proportional to males, then Hadza females are about 86% of the size of Hadza males on average. And you'll notice that's very close to the figure for American males and females at age 19. And that tells us something about the commonalities and similarities that run across humanity. Darwin was also impressed by the power of female choice, and the heart of his argument was that females, if they could decide who they mated with, then the very choices that they made could be a powerful selective force. So he made a distinction between, on the one hand, what's now called intrasexual selection, and as Darwin saw it, this was males, like the male elephant seals, battling over mating opportunities with females. But on the other hand, you had what's now called intersexual selection, and that means it's across the sexes, and this is centered on females choosing which males to mate with. And we're going to come back to the question as why there's such an emphasis on males fighting over access to females, whereas instead of stressing females fighting over access to males, there's an emphasis on female choosiness. Now the last question that we're going to consider in this presentation is just what's the difference between sexual selection and natural selection? And in the contemporary view of things, selection in general refers to any mechanism that raises the reproductive success of one individual relative to others. And many different uh, varieties of selection or selective mechanisms have been identified. All of these together then are grouped under natural selection. So today, sexual selection is thought of as a form of natural selection, as is kin selection and social selection. Uh, we'll be talking about group selection. There's frequency dependent selection. So many different selective mechanisms have been identified and models have been built of these. They're all considered expressions in different forms of natural selection. But this isn't how Darwin was thinking when he came up with the idea. The idea he had was that sexual selection was something quite different from natural selection. And it was meant to explain something quite distinctive. So Darwin drew a distinction between ordinary natural selection and sexual selection. What he meant by natural selection was fitness in the struggle for survival, where sexual selection had to do with fitness in the struggle to gain mates. And I guess the best way to put this was that natural selection was about surviving long enough that you could reproduce where sexual selection was centered just on gaining mates. And for Darwin, this helped to explain something. So the logic of making this distinction and insisting that they were not simply the same thing had two aspects to it. And one was his argument that sexual selection was less rigorous and uh, less powerful of an evolutionary force than natural selection. And there's kind of a long argument behind that that we're going to skip over. But he was also deeply concerned with traits that appeared to be maladaptive when viewed from the perspective of natural selection. And probably the most famous of these is the tail of a male peacock. So peahens, this is the hen in the foreground, don't have the massive tail 
but the peacocks do have this tail, and Darwin was quite sure that this could not be adaptive in the struggle for survival because it would appear to make the peacock much more vulnerable to predation. And so he argued that these characters are the result of sexual and not ordinary selection is clear. And the basis for that clarity in Darwin's thinking was that these traits appear to be maladaptive if you considered them simply in terms of the struggle for survival and natural selection. So for Darwin, to summarize, there were two critical differences. First, sexual selection was less rigorous than natural selection, and secondly, sexual selection could explain behaviors and anatomical features that otherwise appeared maladaptive. Thank you for listening, and there's more to come on this topic.